Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Hello, gentlemen. What's up? On today's episode, we are going to be taking yet another deep dive into how to improve energy systems. Um, I'll I'll try not to bury the lead here. There's there's a decent amount of um, should I be doing zone two work uh, conversation. Um, that I want to provide the entire story, the entire context on to try to give you an answer that might actually apply to you directly and not be like you should either do a ton of it or not do it at all. Um, before we get into that, teammisfit.com or the Sugar Wad Marketplace phase two of Misfit Affiliate Programming is started. It has started right now. Um, it's the kind of programming where you can definitely get signed up at any point, but make sure if you are... Um, an affiliate owner, a coach, a member, um, that you let someone know that you should be on the best affiliate programming that there is out there and that a brand new training phase has started. Before we get into the nitty gritty, nerdy details of this conversation today, um, we will start with live chat as always. Um, where's, where's my list at? Okay. Professor McGonagall, Dikembe Mutombo. Oh, rip. Chris Christopherson and Pete Rose. What the fuck is happening? My childhood is disappearing. It is did Kimbe Matumbo died? He did. Yes. There's been there's been so many in the last week. It's like, like he had brain cancer I need or something like that. Space for McGonagall. You can't <laughs> pile on with this stuff. It's fucking crazy. They say that's what happens when you start getting old. All of your heroes you and friends start dying around you. <laughs> Fuck, man. I got glasses now. Maybe that's why. Oh, fuck. I have glasses. I got glasses died. and Professor yeah. McGonagall died. Yeah. You killed Matumbo <laughs> with uh, glasses, bro. Fucking A. Uh, I will say for anyone that doesn't know, I go to Chris Christopherson's Wikipedia page and read it. Um, I don't know if you like internet rabbit holes, but like he could have been the Dosakis guy in the most Who's interesting. Who's he? I don't know who that uh, is. A singer, country singer. You probably recognize him more from acting, um, like outlaw country, like like Johnny Cash. Like he got famous because he, he was landed in- a helicopter on Johnny Cash's front lawn and gave him the lyrics to Sunday Morning Coming. He down. was in Blade. <laughs> he was in The Rock, right? Isn't he like the the warden or something in The Rock? Mm, I remember. I don't remember. <clears throat> he was in Blade Honestly, though. Didn't know that he was both of those people as a kid. I yeah. didn't know that the guy that I was listening to his music with my dad was also the dude in The Rock. <laughs> There's Wesley Snipes, a vampire sidekick. Yeah. He had like a kind of a, when he got older, he had kind of a badass, like scarred old man look to him. Like he definitely fit like a character type for sure. But his his Wikipedia page, like Road Scholar, Army Ranger, actor. Yeah, like, I see that. University crazy. of Oxford. Yeah, crazy. If I'm being honest, I thought he was dead for a long time because he was old when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Merle Haggard died last year, something like that. I mean, Johnny Cash, That's it's been a while there. Yeah. Um, he lived kind of a hard life. <laughs> but like all of those dudes, like we still got Willie, which is nice. For now. For now. Although he's 91 Willie. and touring still, which is yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah, his secrets, he's just been stoned for 75 hey, years. You know, we <laughs> preserves the innards. Tip of the cap, too. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I like it's not really my life chat, but it kind of is. It's this is just this like bomb of childhood. Like, no, nope, they're all going now. <laughs> Damn it. The fuck is happening? This is too much. This is way too much. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. All for one. Yeah. One week. For real. Uh, I don't know. I do not know who this this person is. Mm. Chris Christopherson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm reading, scrolling through the Wikipedia page, but yeah, really does not. Is it forty year old virgin that they play Chris Christopherson on repeat in the Circuit City that he works at on the TVs? <laughs> Probably. I've seen that movie like 
the first like 12 minutes of it i think on like usa network what that's all you've seen it's a great movie you should watch yeah, it and no, i haven't really seen it um yeah i'm not surprised you don't know who he is hunter thank you yeah you didn't know who pharrell was that was that was a little bit too much for me to take so i'm not gonna be that surprised <laughs> at this point what's well, a pharrell <laughs> Hockey pads? Uh, what you guys got? You got anything uplifting? Uh, my life chat, Jen and I went out for our anniversary, went out to Colorado for a few days, see the, the Wild West countryside. We rode a hundred year old train through the mountains of Colorado and, and New Mexico, uh, just outside of Santa Fe. It was pretty dope. Um, one thing I can say about the Western part of the United States, at least in the mountains, the food is fucking terrible. <laughs> we found no good food out there at all we had some halfway decent tacos for dinner one night um in santa fe but other than that man you guys were in the shit oh yeah we were in you guys the were sticks. out there because like the luckily in colorado the like mountain towns like there's so many rich people there like there's a fucking nobu in Vail. <laughs> which is we, like we didn't boy. see that <laughs> <laughs> this is like like literally in the absolute middle of nowhere like the most remote place on a highway that gets shut down is a fucking nobu yeah Maya and i went there in the summer like a handful of years ago on our anniversary and i think we might have been the only people at the, restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> at the nobu yeah but it's Damn. in Vail. Like, I don't know what the population of Vail is outside of the winter, but it ain't much. Not like you're much. You're just driving along the highway, mountains up both sides, and yeah. there's this tiny town there. But when the snow starts dumping, damn, thousands and thousands of people. With I had a really good, Nobel you said life. Santa Fe, New Mexico, Ted? Yep. <clears throat> yeah. I drove, I remember when I drove cross country, I stopped in, I stopped both New Mexico and Arizona. Arizona, I I got I went to a sushi place in Arizona. You can definitely question my judgment on yeah, that, but it was it, one of the better sushi places that I've ever had. Wow. I was like, where the fuck is this fish coming from? And you lived in San Diego, but yeah, you, that that whole conversation. I mean, like, okay, well, like have, context myth, is like right? it was it's very like Port- good for Arizona sushi. Yeah, Portland, Maine, <laughs> the place that we love that Yosaku. does Yosaku. They're ordering their tuna from fucking Japan and aging it. So like the whole like, oh, I you know ate it fresh off the boat kind of a thing is a bit of a myth with sushi. Now, yeah. oysters in Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you want? Like, uh, it, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe don't not. Know about the all whole that. sushi thing. They're like, fish doesn't taste like much when it's fresh. Yeah. yeah, from a, from like a raw sushi standpoint. Yeah, so yeah. There, you sit at the bar. They'll, they'll at, at Yosaku. They'll talk you up about the whole. Situation. There were definitely fish options on the menus at some of the places that we went to, and every time I was like, "The ocean is so far away. Yeah. I really don't <laughs> yeah, want to risk sushi it." Sushi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I say that. As a, I'm going home I, to the ocean. I'll get some seafood when I'm back home. Yeah, yeah. New Mexico specialty is the green the green Bull chili balls. with the pork in it hatch like yeah. southern yeah the hatch yeah. chili with the pork in i it. was gonna say uh, then i when i was in new mexico i stopped at a place. really fucking good like mexican place mm, it was like yeah. their claim to fame was like obama stopped there on his <laughs> campaign trail <laughs> hey we sick. went to the hot dog stand that bill clinton used to frequent in iceland that's so that's true presidential stops those hot dog, dog stands <laughs> uh yeah i mean new mexico is known like i don't don't want to like start beef with the one listener but it's known for being kind of shitty oh my god yeah did you know santa fe has a higher elevation than denver yeah i didn't know that until we were there there. it's pretty wild when you're there at night it's like what six or seven thousand it's pretty high yeah it's like 775 or something like that yeah yeah Yeah, it gets fucking cold as hell there at night yeah, it got pretty nippy at night. Trip, and it was 90 during the day and like 30 at night. And I mean, the, the good thing day. is there's nothing open and nothing to do at night, so you don't have to worry about being outside. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's just like ghost town yeah. after 7 o'clock hits. <clears throat> I was actually the – I did a um, – on spring break one year in college, I did a solo camping trip, and my first night was in New Mexico, and I was in a tent like – 
come like out in the wilderness by myself and there were some critters there were some coyotes yeah. and there was some noises and nice it did not take me five minutes to fall asleep it took like <laughs> three and a half hours to fall asleep. <laughs> but then by the end of the week i wanted to be a homeless person so i, I got there <laughs> eventually nice uh yeah i think my life chat i'll mix it up a little bit my brother was in town last weekend so we got to uh spend do some family time but uh the last last two weekends i've had lobster at at mom's place so uh nice fuck i i didn't like lobster as a kid i was like just kind of kid food yeah it just like weirded me out i didn't even i tried it once in like i grew up in maine so like it's obvious that's a thing uh tried it once was like not a fan it's definitely grown on me and now i like here's a good question for you too how do you eat your lobster do you like eat it as you go or do you like get the meat out all like get all the meat out, get rid of all the shells and then, and then get after the meat. You get rid of the shells. Are you supposed to eat those? <laughs> 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 no, I, I like to dismantle my lobster completely before Same. I start digging. In. Yeah. Okay. The problem That's with cool. lobster is it's so fucking delicious but the like fullness to effort ratio is way off. It takes so much effort and I have to eat like three or four lobsters yeah, the, the, to get the cal- the cal- calories per dollar is not favorable with lobster, but man, nah, it damn, is does if you it fucking had that carry gold. You know what I'm saying? Well, well yeah, you can well, drink that, a that shot of literally what I was about to say is that sure. I just fucking take that tail and just fucking drag it back and forth <laughs> through a bowl of butter. I'm like, yep. yeah, come on, Let's just sit here. And do you, naughty. do you suck the legs? you a leg sucker yeah i suck legs oh yeah <laughs> yeah are you pure suck or do you nibble a uh, little bit of teeth yep i'll like get the yeah get just get enough just enough teeth to kind of funnel it straight into my throat man get the str- you, funnel that meat straight into the, 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 through the leg you're the exact girl i was yeah. looking for in high school hunter yeah <laughs> <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah. yeah do you eat the tamale the green shit hell yeah no, no drew hell no. yeah yeah no i do I eat. I try to eat as much of the lobster as I can. Oh, Start bro. with the body. Here's well. Here's the here's the order operation. I'd make like a soup with it or something. I can't just mainline that. <laughs> I, I need some kind of put it in a. Sandwich. I mean, I'll like put it on because it's like just really salty and savory. I'll just kind of put it on put it a cracker, like, maybe or the crab meat, like one of the like claws. If they could change or whatever, the color of but, it. That would be cool. Who's was that? <laughs> those <laughs> lobsters. If those lobsters could change it. Whoever's running hey, the simulation. Hear me out you for a make second, that boys. Shit the same color as lobster. How do you approach your lobster hunter? Yeah, I pull pull the pull the head out. I'll like yeah, crack the tail off. So now I've got the head. I'll pull the head like all of like the I don't yeah I guess the head with the small legs, and I'll like nibble on kind of like the body because there's a bunch of meat in there, but you can't like. It's almost like eating like a chicken wing. Like you got to kind of be careful so you're not eating like the bone or like the the shell structure. The meat between the legs. Until you said so shell, good. that clip was fucking gold. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got, the, you got you got you got the whole fucking leg sucking <laughs> clip to 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 work with. So lot. I'm sure you, uh, to work you, you got some. Well, yeah, a lot to work with. So <laughs> nibble. Yeah, the body's kind of the appetizer because it is like it is a lot of effort and it's going to be like 15 minutes before I'm actually eating lobster, you know, from start to start of dismantling to actually like a clean enough plate to eat body, suck the legs, then I'll get after the uh, dismantle. You go tail tail first? Do you eat the tail first? No, fuck no. Tails last. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So you like I get rid like of the, the get rid of the head the once cloth. I once I eat the body and suck legs. That all goes into the uh like the communal bowl of just like stuff that's gone. Then I'll go to the claws. Claws and like arms, use a little pick to punch out all like the arm meat, pull out the claw meat. So what's better, claw meat T- or tail? Tail. Wow. Tails last, punch the tail out. That's the that's the fucking I go tail. I go tail first. In really? Fact, sometimes I'll eat two tails before getting <laughs> to the. Yeah, that's. I pile the fucking claw meat up on the side, and I'm like, oh, yeah. I, I pile it all up on the side, better. but yeah, I usually go claws first, and then I just fucking love just dragging that tail through butter. <laughs> I tend to go. I tend to eat claws first, but I pop the tail 
pull the tail, save the little wings at the end and suck those bad boys. And then take the claws, get that shit out, put it next to the next to the tail meat. I'll pull the helmet off, get rid of the helmet, scrape the tamale. And then yeah. I'll eat the claws, eat the tails, and then the leg sucking and picking the meat through like between the shoulder blades or whatever. That's my dessert. Oh, that's, no. that's See, the that's the appetizer. Bang. That's that's like, all right, I want to taste some lobster, but I need to save the best parts of it for last. So I'm going to, the appetizer is the, is the leg suck. I think lobster might be the only food where I don't save the best part for last. Mm. Mm. I save the that's, most evolved part for last. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, I don't know that there's- And I had oysters. Oysters are fucking good. That so. demonstrates yeah. us- <laughs> in a way of going from the conversation that we just had into talking about energy systems. <laughs> We're just talking about leg sucking. Yeah. yeah. Go, All right, let's yeah. talk about energy systems. But. Yeah. Um, so I'm Hunter still going to be thinking about the leg sucking just for the record. Honestly, yeah. honestly, Ted, y- you as well, don't let me, you guys have the job of not letting me get too far into the weeds. Now that could mean it's confusing or it's boring. Now, Ted, if you're bored... Before I start, then <laughs> then that doesn't count. Um, but if it gets like really gets to a certain point, you let. Now me. that we're done talking about lobsters, Ted is bored, so maybe I'm the guy for that. I'm just but. googling <laughs> pictures of lobsters right now. Yeah. Um, Ted's got tail suck in his browser in his browser history. Head nibble. So head nibble. <laughs> one one thing that you'll see a lot on I don't even know what to call it the CrossFit. Instagram, CrossFit, YouTube, like our, our bubble, um, is, and I don't know, we're just, we're different in a way that we're not always going to like lean into things like clickbait or pandering or sensationalism to try to get you guys to watch a certain thing. I think we have a, a certain type of, uh, listener, um, uh, people that gravitate towards the style of programming that, that we do, the style of coaching that we do, and the fact that we talk about uh, leg sucking on the same podcast as the one where we're going into zone two. Um, and while it's not Just like the worst teeth. thing in the world that other people do lean into, again, clickbait being like a shock jock, sensationalism, all of those different things, um, you have to know how to pick through what people are saying and why they're trying to get you to listen to something like, is it based on just getting views or are they trying to educate you? And one conversation that comes up all the fucking time is like, are you in the camp of only do zone two, like seven hours a week of zone two as a CrossFitter thumbs up or it's stupid and it's a waste of time. Um, there seems to be like, you have to make a decision in that way. And that makes basically no sense. Um, Like it's a specific tool that's used for a specific thing. And there's an amount of volume that we would recommend for someone that is, you know, has incredible aerobic functioning and then someone who does not. Um, And we're going to get into all of that stuff. But um, maybe one of the easiest ways to, to intro it and talk about it a little bit before we get into all of the energy systems is why it would be used in a scenario where you're not trying to improve on a specific weakness. Um, And if we had like a magical numbering system for intensity where say one is a zone one session and 10 is like power output work. Like if we had this sliding scale that gave us like, okay, this is a seven intensity score. And then we multiplied that by the amount of volume that you did within that intensity. So that could be how many meters, calories, whatever, or it could just, just be time. That number that spits out the other side is, is kind of the um, sort of return on investment that you get for training, right? Like you can go incredibly hard for a very short period of time and get pretty good results from it after you recover, or you can go really, really long and really slow, um, low intensity, higher volume, and you can get something out of that as well. And there's perks to both of those things. Um, and the equivalent in the strength world is for the longest time, it was like four by one, like 
get you the best one rep max and five by five gets you, you know, sort of the strength endurance and then hypertrophy is three by 12 or whatever it is. And they keep studying it and they find that people just get stronger and gain more muscle when they lift weights. And you can either lift <laughs> really fucking heavy weights for lower reps and get a lot of bang for your buck, or you can bodybuild. You can go in and do a shitload of reps at a lighter weight. And again, benefits to, to sort of both sides of these things. You know, you're in and out of the gym, maybe a little bit more in your, you know, four by one or seven by one session where you're lifting super heavy. And then, you know, bodybuilding takes time. If you want to get, you know, a lot out of it, you know, if you're doing sets of 20, you have to rest a long time in between, et cetera. But some of these things have a like very big effect on your heart rate variability, your central nervous system, and then other ones don't. So in a, in a CrossFit situation, if let's say I'm peaking an athlete for like a semi quarterfinal, semifinals CrossFit games, at a certain point, the really high intensity score, shorter duration stuff, and the stuff that's more in the middle, like if we add too much of that up, then you're not going to get the like super compensation. You're not going to come out the other side fitter. We're just going to beat the shit out of you. So if we need more volume in those periods of time, how do we do it? One of the ways that we achieve that is through zone two. So like at the peak of the highest volume of the entire year that we program for anyone, you would have an athlete doing three sessions that are anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes of zone two throughout the week. And we find that we can get that amount of volume and intensity that we need when we do that without beating the absolute shit out of the athletes. So if that, if it's like we have a long Metcon, that's really nasty. We have a, a, you know, a short interval. That's really nasty. If we can then go achieve the zone two without crushing someone, whereas a third piece that day in that higher intensity would be a huge problem there. Um, and, that starts to take shape of like, why would we use it for someone that doesn't need the specific energy system manipulation that we would do maybe in the off season? Who doesn't need specific energy s manipulation that we would do in the off season? I believe that there are too many machines and modalities to master within the CrossFit space to completely ignore zone two work. I think... I think at a minimum, an athlete should be doing one session per week in the CrossFit space. Competitive CrossFit space. Correct. Yes. How long? And that's that's top to bottom. Um, semifinals and CrossFit Games athletes, we progress them from the 45-minute working window, which actually takes 75 minutes to be clear, 15-minute um, warm-up and cool down. We get a decent chunk of zone one um, represented in there as well. But 45 minutes up to as much as 90 minutes in that working window once a week. Um, I like to progress it in sort of the pyramid style. So you'd have an athlete go from 45 minutes up to 60 or something like that in the middle and then back down sort of the other side before they go into testing. Yeah, so sorry, maybe the I misunderstood though. You alluded to somebody who doesn't need specific energy systems training. Yeah. And so I'm like, who who. I, I might, I, it was kind of a trick. I was like, who sure. doesn't yeah, need yeah. that? Like everybody yeah, needs course. that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it just, it, it's a recipe that's going to be different for different athletes and it varies by like degree. That's, that's yeah. like such a huge part of it. And we'll get into what that means in a bit, but I just wanted to open up the conversation by saying these are different tools that are used in different scenarios for different reasons. So I can give someone who has a great aerobic base zone to work during games prep because I'm getting them the volume accumulation that they need without like absolutely crushing them. In the off season, it's more about we're trying to manipulate a particular machine, particular energy system, et cetera, when we're trying to figure out what that dose looks like. Yeah, and I think for athletes, this is the, this is the conversation of stimulus being more important than specific movements uh, for a massive, for, for, I would say like, if you're, you know, you're somebody who think, think about it from a class scenario where, you know, an athlete struggles with a chest to chest to bar pull-ups in the workout. That's supposed to be a, a Fran feel. Maybe, 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 maybe it is Fran, uh, that we're, we're talking about thrusters and pull-ups. An athlete has the 
let's say maybe strength to do the thrusters, but along with that strength comes a lack of body weight, you know, of, of, of body weight capacity. So in that scenario, the question wouldn't necessarily be like, well, what sort of pulling gymnastics movement can I get this athlete to do? If, if the goal is to feel like you just did Fran, the answer might be thrusters and burpees thrusters and rowing on a you know rowing thrusters and even like a bike or something like that because the intent the fran kind of time domain is intended to be kind of that really gnarly glycolytic lactate threshold pathway that's gonna that you know everybody who's listening to this has done fran and has hopefully done fran hard enough at some point uh to 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 feel the real effects of it um and that is kind of a representation of like Fran tests that kind of power, like almost that power endurance kind of kind of energy system time frame where we have to go very, very hard. We, we're not we're not sprinting as hard as possible on the road or on an assault bike. That's a different hard. But when we're approaching Fran and for a lot of people listening to this, you know, it is like it's an unbroken effort. It's fast. It sucks afterward. But. It's more about the energy system and the the stimulus that is elicited than it is, say, the movement, for example. And we also saw that during COVID, um, Caroline being an excellent example of someone who couldn't really train in the gym super frequently. Um, and like when you're training for the CrossFit Games, having access to lots of implements, lots of different things, because she has the the toolkit that she has to get fitter is massive and when that toolkit shrinks down the immediate concern is like i'm going to lose capacity in all of these very specific movements for inexperienced crossfitters younger you know either newer maybe you're just getting competitive or whatever that that actually might be accurate but it it's much less of a concern than you should probably think and it is way more important that we attempt to match the overall stimulus of a training piece versus trying to, you know, modify or replicate exact movement patterns. That's important, but I would say that the stimulus and the energy systems conversation is more important um, as far as developing yeah, fitness. Yeah, a lot of what you're explaining is like, if you get fit enough, you can fit enough, skilled enough, strong enough exactly what you're explaining is how you would prep someone for a competition to get them in the absolute best shape possible. For sure. We tell people in competition prep, like weeks one through four, if your shoulder's bothering you, we're not fucking, we don't need to press. It's fine. Yeah. We need to like, like zap your energy system. We, we need to go through and check off all these boxes, but they're stimulus related. We On need the back you fit half, and healthy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, in this podcast and on, there's a there's a blog post. If you go to misfitathletics.com, click on blog. The second post that you see there is Building Athlete IQ, How to Use the Misfit Gears Matrix. Um, there's that. You can DM me. There are no secrets here. I will tell you exactly what I think you need to do. Of course, I just think you should follow our program because it's built in there. Um, but I will tell you exactly what you need to do. Like We're going to talk about... Um, an athlete making this ridiculous change in their running capacity in this podcast. I will tell you exactly how they did it because the likelihood of you doing it over a seven year period <laughs> to the extent that I'm going to explain is pretty low, right? Like, like the, the, what's special about someone changing in that way is their willingness to put in the work and let it take the time that it needs to follow the natural order of things. It's not special to write constantly varied like machine work <laughs> and be like, do all of these things because they come back together to create a great athlete. Um, and I would say the, the, the part of this that I think some people will struggle with that will watch um, some of the YouTube channels that use specific studies from the endurance community. Some of them are even doing their own studies now within the CrossFit community, which is fantastic. Um, there are things that we do and we program because they work. 
very specific to our cohort of athletes over the last 12 plus years. Um, and the exact mechanism as to why they work and how they work, um, it's, it, it, it will make sense when we explain it, but like, I think there's something to the endurance community is typically chasing one modality or one time domain. And we are chasing every modality in every fucking time domain that you could imagine, right? Like there was a fucking sprint at the CrossFit Games and there was multiple hours long row. You need to prepare for both of those things. That's crazy, right? So in that article that I referenced, the the short version of it is basically when I'm remote coaching and I'm looking at test retest results and trying to figure out why one athlete is like making huge gains in a specific area and why another athlete is like just knocking off a second at a time, I started to notice that the athletes who performed the biased machine or running or whatever at the most varied speeds ended up having the best results. So an athlete who had a 530 pace, a 545 pace, a six minute per mile pace, all the way up to like an eight minute mile pace over the course of one phase, two phase, three phases that hit all of these places were the ones who had the biggest return on investment for what they were doing. Um, now, it's kind of funny, almost sounds like CrossFit, <laughs> right? Like it's like CrossFit for monostructural conditioning and obviously monostructural conditioning is a part of the sport, but it was really fascinating to see like if an athlete was doing the different, like, like I've put it up on the board before and I've explained it, but like just spending time at a 130, a 135, a 140, a 145, a 150, a 155, a two minutes on a C2 machine, they were the ones who were making the progress. Um, and again, I think that a lot of that has to do with needing to be so good in all of these different places versus I run marathons, I run 5Ks, I run the mile, I do triathlons, I do Ironmans, et cetera. That's my theory on why it works. Yeah, I think to, sorry, I didn't know if you were done or not. The, I think the the interesting thing that will, uh, one thing to understand about like, about the CrossFit methodology as a whole is, and this is like Glassman talked a lot about this, is that it's empirical, meaning it's, it's through, it's through observation that we know that this works. It's not necessarily that it's been studied in a in a lab and i and i think there would be a lot of like i mean you you also have to take studies like that with a grain of salt like i was reading one that talked about uh nervous system fatigue uh and it was like used a 75 minute bicep curl test and i'm like <laughs> i was like like, fuck I was like yeah, what the dog? fuck yeah. is happening? So like, I'm, I'm like, like, kind of like this is that. like, uh, okay, so we're clearly trying to answer a specific mm -hmm. question, but the problem is with a lot of these studies is is just exactly how specific they are. So, in to the to the point of the endurance community, it's like, okay, we we can again, the endurance community is is getting fitter, but within a single modality, uh, there's no skill involved. There's no, or not, I'm not, not, there's not no skill involved, but you understand relative to yeah. the complexity of muscle ups or handstand push ups or whatever. And even with a CrossFitter, the, the difficulty with studying these things in a controlled setting is the variability of the training. Like at the end of the day, we have no idea why, you know, like I'm sore today. Was it because of the f work that I did yesterday? Is it because of the work I did two days ago? Why is it that on certain days when I actually think that I feel badly, I tend to perform, I, you know, I perform better. There's, there are two, there's so many variables within the CrossFit, a, a typical CrossFit program that it's really difficult to, to isolate individual variables. I would say the zone two work specifically is one of those things where, because it's so far outside of what is typically asked in a CrossFit setting, we can more confidently say that like this works. And it's also just known that that style of training is like, 
you know, for an endurance athlete, that might be upwards of 80% of their total volume of training. Right. So, uh, whether it's a cyclist or, or runner or whatever, but, um, the rest of it, you know, the, the super high power output stuff, some of the anaerobic stuff and the aerobic stuff, like there's a lot of leeway there as far as what we know about how to improve those things. And I think CrossFit, if anything has kind of like torn the manual in half and been like, like, man, eh, maybe like, Maybe it turns out that just lifting weights like gets you fitter and stronger and more hypertrophy, kind of like you alluded to in the beginning. There might not be a magical set rep scheme that that right. applies to a single the magic desired is result. And trying, yeah, the magic is just doing the work. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I wanted to use the C two bike as an example of of how we would monitor an athlete's energy systems. And I want you to picture a, you know, typically it would be listed out as like a pyramid or a hierarchy, but I just want you to picture a triangle with four like dividing lines in it. Um, the bottom of the triangle would be zone two. That second rung would be aerobic work, third anaerobic, and then the fourth being power output, being that little sort of triangle at the tip there. You want the bottom left to right, the bottom of your triangle to stretch as wide as you can. You want the, your ability to do work at a lower heart rate to get as good as you possibly can. Um, if you're doing the exact same thing as someone else at the same speed or faster and you feel better than they do, I think we understand the concept here. Now in the other direction, we wanna stretch the triangle as high as possible. That peak, would be your like absolute max power output. And then as we look through the triangle, we want things to stay kind of even as we're going on the way up. You wouldn't want like from a, a, a true like triangle shape standpoint, you wouldn't want the like, you know, I have no zone two at the bottom and then I can get to 600 watts on a, on a C2 bike. Um, <clears throat> not sure who I'm talking about there, um, but you wouldn't want that to be the case. Um, but you also wouldn't want like it to, to be like concave in a way. So you wouldn't want, and this isn't like the most possible thing in the world, but there are people who will struggle that, that, you know, do well in zone two that struggle once they get up into the higher end anaerobic type stuff. So we want those things to feel even. And when a coach uses testing or just scores from a session to, to see where there is an issue within the chain, that's when you can personalize programming. That's when you can go in and be like, this person really struggles here um, and we got to figure out a plan to make it better, put more attention on that thing. Um, so an example would be <clears throat> zone two. So this is 55 to 70% of your FTP, your functional threshold pace, would be over 200 watts for a male and over 150 watts for a female. Um, <clears throat> that works out to about a two minute pace um, for those that, that don't really know wattage in a, in a 212. We go up to the aerobic energy system. This would actually be, in a lot of cases, your FTP type test. Um, over 300 watts for males. Can I explain FTP for the listeners? Yeah, we'll get there. Um, basically, just how, how hard can you, can you ride the machine? It's actually supposed to be for an hour. A lot of people use the conversion test with, with 20 minutes. But what would your average wattage be if you sat down on a C2 bike for an hour? Um, men over 300 watts, um, women over 200 watts. Now, this is ideal for a CrossFit Games type athlete and also just the idea that we're going from 200 to 300 to 400 just to show that there's kind of an even split as we work our way up. We get into the anaerobic situation here, over 400 watts, so that would be 135 um, or less and over 300 watts, 145 or less. Last but not least, power output. There's a lot of variance here with athletes, but I want to see my athletes over 500 watts um, at the you know semifinals CrossFit Games level um, on power output repeats, and then over 350 watts on the women's side. Um, and the point of saying all of that again is to just show like as a CrossFitter, as a competitive CrossFitter, we need balance 
between these energy systems. And that's something that we would strive for if one of these things was way out of whack. Um, when, when you were going to do, you know, a, a workout at misfitathletics.com and, and you could never sniff over 400 Watts in like a eighth gear, which would be 90 seconds on four minutes off that kind of thing. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I think this, I think it just, so like to maybe simplify a little bit, I think you should be thinking about this at, in terms of, in terms of the, so we, we do the gears thing as well. And the idea here is just having distinct levels of effort that you know are sustainable for a given period of time, right? So our zone two work being the lowest output, we should be able to sustain that sort of the the desired output for a, a, a very long time, right? On the order of hour, you know, in the hour realm. And as we go up the ladder, up the pyramid, so to speak, the you know, the average output is increasing, which also means the duration that you are capable of sustaining that output is going down. So again, just a concept here of having multiple gears to be able to shift to. And we talk a little bit about this at the affiliate level um, because the, the difference is, so a CrossFit Games athlete on one extreme and a new affiliate athlete on the other extreme, the CrossFit Games athlete is fit enough that, you know, I can, you know, let's, we'll, we'll use, are we using Paige for our future, future athlete here? So we'll take Paige as an example, sure. CrossFit, seven times CrossFit, seven time CrossFit games athlete. She can start a 20 minute workout or let's say a 10 minute workout by really ramping up the bike a little bit because her fitness is at a level that she's going to, she can actually recover later on in the workout, assuming that she's not going irresponsibly fast right so she has the capacity to literally within a longer duration workout adjust her output you know up or down accordingly someone who's at the affiliate level oftentimes they don't have you you need to have a certain baseline level of fitness to be able to go you know to be able to adjust those gears and you know for for a lot of athletes we can really make it really simple like walk run sprint right it's like hey you have three maybe three different gears that you adjust between the one is like i'm just moving to recover real low effort i am trying moderately hard and then i am trying as hard as i possibly can right so just having those extremes and then as we get fitter we can start to add different kind of levels of output maybe there is a, a gear that exists between very little effort and a sustainable effort and we can slowly start to to expand that and kind of in theory you know make that pyramid that triangle a little bit higher but it in order to be able to have access to these energy systems there's a baseline of fitness that's required to to simply like be able to train in and access them effectively so if we have a a disparity um, we're basically work our way down the list here introduce some of the more specifics of the way that we program if we have a disparity in power output um, first address just testing we use a, a 50 cal test on most machines it can it can be anywhere from I would say 30 seconds to 90 seconds, somewhere in that range would be kind of the, the place we're looking for. And the reason why that could be such a wide range is because on a rower, you've got your recovery phase on the skier, you got your recovery phase, like all out on a C2 bike for 30 seconds or sprinting on like an air runner for 30 seconds is much different. The, the, the demand of moving your body continuously in that way is different. And I feel like we should call that power yeah. endurance. Yeah, I mean, so so it's relative to the it's relative to the sport, um, and we use it's a way to test um, if you are ma able to make changes within because like our workouts are you know ten second windows, twenty second windows, thirty second windows when right. we're training power output, but within the sport, um, that's the way that we would measure that. So yeah, you're I think, actually I think going to find your peak output in a session that's five by 10 seconds on a machine, like on a C2 bike. That's where you're gonna find out how high you can go, but you're not really gonna be able to use that within the sport unless you can hold it for 
again, 30 to 90 seconds. Yeah, I think that's the important distinction is like the test is actually more like by the book, more anaerobic or more like, you know, in that in that sort of glycolytic energy system versus like that extreme power up because you only have 10 seconds in theory of 100 percent maximal output. But when it and so we can train in there. But like you said, when it comes to testing, we it's probably more reasonable and effective. Like we got to kind of like it's a it's a full send and hold on sort of thing. And I think that's just unique to the sport versus a, you know, a hundred meter Olympic sprinter where it's legitimately like a 10 second true power output sort of thing. So then the question becomes, what do you do to actually improve those things? One of the most obvious ones that's there that gets looked over is strength accumulation. Like for me, I have had periods of like massive strength to fitness imbalance and I would do significantly better on this test just because of strength, right? Like doing Texas method all the time on back sure. squat, et cetera. Force your production. Ability, exactly. Your ability to go in and do that. So if you're really struggling with power output um, and like the higher end anaerobic work, you're, you know, seventh and eighth gear and you're not focusing on strength to, to move the needle, that would be huge. Another part of it, and this goes for, for all four of the styles of workouts we're going to talk about today, is technique. Like ski erg and rower. I kind of disappeared there for a second. I don't know if you guys heard all that. You're um, good, Drew. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ski erg and the rower, like you can send energy in uh, different directions that are not the direction you want <laughs> to go on those things. So like if you are not technically proficient on something and your power output scores are either all over the place or just bad, like that could be a huge part of it. So something to address. Um, The actual power output sessions themselves. So this is a kind of a newer extension that that will be put onto the the gears matrix in in the future. But basically P1, P2, and P3 just means like P1 is full send. That's going to be like 10 to 15 seconds on a continuous machine. So your, you know, your bikes, your, your air bikes, that kind of thing. And then 20 to 30 seconds on the machines where you get a recovery. So you're doing that three to five times all out, everything you've got, that sort of thing. Um, P2, little bit of a step back um, from that, but not much. Um, you to, to notice progress, a lot of times I'll tell athletes to chase they're like old P1 scores with P2 just as a way to work on linear progression, but you're more like 15 to 20 seconds on continuous machines and 30 to 40 seconds on the other machines. Now, one thing that's important to note on this is we actually ask for full recovery most of the time. In in, uh, competition prep, we will mandate rest periods a little bit more often because it's like this is where you need to be at this point in the season, but a lot of people confuse um, mid to high end anaerobic work for power output work. So that's your like grab a friend and go do 30 on 30 off with them on the assault bike for a long time. Like it's a good workout. It's not what you think it is. Like a lot of people are like good old fashioned power output work. It's like, no, I don't think so. That's not what that is. Um, So we're working on those things and Anytime you're trying to improve an energy system, you want to go above and below it. We can't go above power output, essentially. So below would be your anaerobic work. That would be the stuff that that we do um, on the website that says gears four through eight. And I won't go too, too far into the weeds on that. I think reading the article for you guys would be helpful. It's short. It comes with some sample workouts and shows you the gears matrix. Um, so I don't want to just read that whole thing there. Um, anything on the power output stuff, Hunter? <clears throat> kind of straightforward yeah i think that's probably the most straightforward that's just like go hard i I think the the conversation the the row ski is always an interesting conversation i hate it personally like i i know it's necessary to work do power output work on those machines um but for the reasons that we talked about the technical aspects of them i think we get so much more bang for our buck doing bike run type power output stuff from just an energy system perspective. I think any time that we ask for 
maximal effort like that, like trying to balance that out with a lower barrier to entry from a technical perspective is always good. But if you, if you want to be competitive in the sport, it's yeah, sorry. It's, it's, it's another example of tools in the tool bag and like one of them, you know, might be more effective. So if you have to choose, you're going to choose, you know, this like assault bike sprints or, <laughs> you know, it doesn't yeah. get much better than that. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, to like hits a, a lot of musculature, crushes your lungs, crushes your legs, all that good stuff. Um, so we moved down from there to the anaerobic, um, on the anaerobic side, we use the cube test for testing. It's really fun. I recommend everyone go try it. Four rounds, AMRAP four minutes, four calories, meters, whatever the fuck you want, and then rest four minutes. So four on, four off for four rounds. Um, you can really find something out about not just your energy systems, but the way that you pace when you do that. Um, you technically should get a little bit slower. Like you don't always want to say that as a coach because then it's way slower. Um, but if you were to get the absolute best score, let's say this was like in a competition, um, like dropping just a tiny bit while testing round around a calorie or two is, is the way that you're going to get the best score. Um, how do we improve it? Go above and below. Um, so that's power output work. That's aerobic work. We're making sure that we have the ability to go fast and we have the ability to clear waste. Really important when you're essentially trying to do those things simultaneously. Um, gears four through eight. So we're looking at, to give you guys a, a bit of a, a spectrum here, gear four, um, you're gonna be doing four and a half to eight minutes of work with two to two and a half minutes of rest for a certain number of rounds. And then eighth gear is 90 seconds to two minutes with four minutes rest. Um, so, so spanning that and, um, just, you know, fourth gear, fifth gear, sixth gear, seventh gear, eighth gear, um, is essentially our way of tracking and explaining the phenomenon that I brought up at the beginning of like what has worked for a lot of athletes for a long period of time. Um, and it also has the like the like mental benefit of for athletes, you get to track what you're doing and you get to know it's almost like I now have a PR eighth gear session on a certain machine, which I think just can be really helpful. It gives athletes context for pacing. And then if they're feeling fantastic on a day, like, okay, I'm now faster. I can go for this, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the the idea really on all these is to go, you know, in order to get better at them, we need to not only train the specific thing, but above and below them, we can think about our, our zone two work. If we're thinking about the cube test or four minutes on four minutes off four times for kind of like the goal would be maximum, probably average power output, or, you know, the, the best average pace across those. It, it's someone who annihilates the first round is probably not going to result, have the best score overall just due to recovery. But Yep. With the zone two work, we we in theory increase the floor, so we don't necessarily increase you know your the the peak that you can get to, but we do increase we do we do raise the floor so to speak, so we know that we can just sustain the same or a slightly higher you know minimum like floor pace for longer. And then on the other end of that spectrum, the power output stuff obviously like gets you comfortable and whether it's you know whether you are getting stronger with the power output stuff or just the like you can get strong by doing certain types of machine based or running power output stuff but we we basically yeah above and below kind of dials in the you know above we learn that maybe we can hold slight two three seconds faster and then the below the zone two stuff teaches us that hey we can actually recover at a certain threshold place and therefore we should be able to go faster on average and the bigger disparity between your power output and your aerobic system the more you need to go below like that's one thing that i think people get confused mm. about like if you have the if your triangle is you know an inch wide and four feet tall mm. and you just kind of poke it and tip it over like you need to really stretch that base out like that's, you have to, you got to go down there and get that work in because you're just never going to be able to like, you're always going to feel fantastic at the beginning of workouts and then wonder like, 
like, why can't I continue to repeat these rounds? This doesn't make yeah. any sense. Round That's one, the athlete round one who was loves such a joke. So easy. I, yeah. Why can't I do it again if it was easy? Um, and then in the opposite scenario, this is the this is the one where it's like you're balancing out. Like, is this brutal on my body or my mind? Like, for the power mm. output athlete, fifty five percent of your shitty FTP is not going to be. It's going to be boring. And be like, why am I doing this? There's no way that this works, especially if I'm a CrossFitter. Like, I'm I'm at a hundred watts right now on a bike. Like, I weigh two hundred pounds. I'm at a hundred watts. What the <laughs> hell is happening here? Like, how is this going to work? Spoiler alert: It does work really well. Um, and then in the opposite direction, if your triangle is I don't know, more of like a chode shape, um, you know, really, really wide at the base, but doesn't stick out very far. Um, unfortunately, it's that chode, power output nice. work and that anaerobic work and the strength work is incredibly important to be able to like stretch that up and yeah. get to a point where you can really like make a difference there. Um, going down to aerobic work, um, there's there's a few different ways to, to test this. Um, full disclosure, on the C2 bike, we use Tour de Misfit because it's fucking 23 to 30 minutes long. And like, that's going to work as a test retest model for a CrossFitter within that space. All of the other machines, we use a step test or an FTP test. Um, and some sometimes both. Step test is your traditional, like you start at a certain number of calories at a, every two minutes, every one minute, every three minutes, and you just add one. It's like survivor style. Can you get it done? Death by. That's that's your typical kind of step test there. We use that a lot outside of the um, C2 bike. And then on the FTP side, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. So it, it, an actual FTP functional threshold pace test is supposed to be an hour long. You are supposed to run, row, bike, ski, whatever for an hour and then take your average power output and that is your FTP. A lot of people, like this has gotten so crazy that people have made a five minute version, which if you understand energy systems is the dumbest bullshit <laughs> ever, especially for a CrossFitter. But the conversion that is used the most is a 20 minute FTP test where you multiply your score by 0.95. The problem with that in the CrossFit space is CrossFitters start hot and slow, have this really skewed number, and there's no way they could hold 95% of that for an hour. No fucking chance, right? And if we're like using percentage-based stuff to do your zone two, which is big in the endurance community, then those numbers are going to be off. And it's why I got so many messages when I asked people to row at 55% of their FTP. And it's like, this works, this will help you, this won't stroke your ego. And that can be tough for people. They're like, this is a joke. I'm like, yeah, it's fucking zone one, zone two. It's not supposed to be hard. You're supposed to be able to fucking have a conversation while you're doing it. You're supposed to be able to nasal breathe, whatever, any of those things. Um, so I would be wary of that. The 20 minute version that works is a pace that you hold for 20 minutes straight. Like Hunter goes and gets on the bike and holds 270 watts on the fucking dot, plus or minus a few here and there for 20 minutes, there's a pretty good chance he could come close to 95% of that for an hour with a few more kind of ups and downs along the way. But if you have, you start at 330 and end at 250 and you take the average of that, then that's really not going to work. That's not going to be the most helpful thing in the world. And then endurance community, people get so good at going long that that 20 minute to 60 minute conversion is actually there. But like we're talking, you know, we used to have a member who was like a like national level marathoner and he couldn't jump on a 12 inch box when he started. So like <laughs> that's what you're doing to your energy systems and manipulating them to have your, you can only go 5% faster in 20 minutes than you can at 60. So just to sort of put that out there. Um, but that's a really great way to test your aerobic system. Like, Either 60 minutes, do what you got to do. The average number that's spit out the other side is probably a really good representation of it. Or 20-minute version where you don't let yourself have, you know, a, one of the five-minute, one of the four or five-minute splits be significantly faster or slower than another. It's also, to be clear, 
you are like your maximum sustainable for those times. It's not go sit on a bike and pedal for one hour and what's oh, the no. average? The, it's the what's the P test is a fucking out of body experience. <laughs> yeah, it's like what 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 can you what is what do you think you can actually hold at that same position for? Yeah, the duration that you've selected. So right, yeah. yes, both versions of that test are very rough, really hard. Like. Yeah, I mean, you're, twenty minute, five k row. How hard you can That's pretty for, fucking for terrible. Like, yeah, exactly. Um, so, how do we get better in the aerobic? You're gonna notice a pattern here, so I won't take too much time. Anaerobic exposure, balance of first, second, and third gear. First, second, and third gear. We're gonna be looking at like f- fifteen minute windows and only a minute rest, all the way down to like three minutes off two and a half or three minutes on two and a half minutes off for like a lot of rounds, that sort of thing. So we're getting volume and the workouts on this gears matrix are designed to force faster and slower speeds. That's the whole point of it. And it's been tested on so many different athletes that like, again, unless you have a huge disparity here in in your energy systems, like all this stuff is going to line up pretty well. It's going to be possible for you to go do it. So anaerobic exposure, balance your one, through three gears and then zone two exposure once again. Last but not least, the talk of the town, zone two work. Um, testing, I don't really, so so there's, in a lot of the, the like specific endurance communities, they wanna talk about watts per kilo. They wanna talk about like how big you are relative to what your power output is when you're doing zone two sessions. If you really wanted to compare yourself to another athlete, you could use this to make yourself feel better if they're huge and you're small, but like it's CrossFit, right? So like you get off the bike and you go do muscle ups and they have to do muscle ups carrying 215 pounds and you doing them at 190 or whatever it is, that sort of thing. So it's not quite as relevant. Um, It's really just like, September of 2024, I was able to hold 150 watts in a zone two session and I felt pretty damn good. And then September 2028, I hold 220 watts and I feel fantastic. Like that's kind of the the test retest model here. It's it's the percentage based type stuff. It's the like, we still love Maffetone for running. Um, it's, it's really tough to quantify in the same way the metrics for running and we get incredible results with athletes who stay below 180 minus their age in their zone two running. Um, so that's something that has not changed over the course of time. We haven't really had to force people to go slower on the running. The running's pretty slow. <laughs> the machines on the other hand, depending on size and like how much you like a certain machine, you end up getting some, some kind of differences there. Um, how do you improve your zone two? You get aerobic exposure gears one through three. You follow linear progression. That's thoughtful in zone two. You like actually doing zone two and not zone three and zone four because you want to feel better about yourself while you're doing it. Um, and then actually zone one exposure. So if you're like, if you have that again, really like narrow base and really tall peak, you're going to help yourself on active rest days by like rocking for an hour, like trying to get your heart rate up to that, like 100 to like 130 beats per minute kind of range. Um, depending on your age, obviously there's, there's like certain context there, but the, the worse you are at zone two work, like the more you could help yourself along by doing zone one. And then the opposite scenario would be, which I don't think we have to deal with in the CrossFit community very often, but if you're world class um, at a certain thing, zone two a lot of times actually is too high of an intensity. So like we've mentioned it before, but Kipchoge spends most of his time in zone one and it's like a six minute mile or something like that. <laughs> Stupid. Which is just too much. Yeah. Um, I mean, anecdotally, I've spent way more time well below that one, but closer to like 160 minus my age. Yeah. Um, as far as heart rate goes, and that's on a C2 bike as well. And I, I've seen really good progress and it's weird too, cause it doesn't necessarily reveal itself on the machine itself. Uh, as far as like the pace goes, it's more just like after doing it for, you know, a few weeks, it's like, 
wow, that Metcon felt really easy or like my legs, there was, you know, my lungs were of no bother to me in that workout and it was yeah. just muscular failure that went when everybody else is, is dry heaving next to the trash can. Um, so I, I would encourage people, especially on that zone two stuff, like maybe it does toe the line between zone one and zone two, as far as like being on the lower end of that heart rate area. And I think that also accomplishes what you just alluded to with somebody who's really fit, like whose zone two work might even be a little bit fast for them. Like, I, I don't think like, I don't want to say you can't go too slow, but it's probably okay to go slower than you think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why on the C2 machines that you'll notice at misfitathletics.com this year, you are forced to do the FTP test and then do percentage based because it's like, you need to prove that you are within these ranges that we're talking about. Mm. And like in your instance, what you're talking about, Hunter, if I noticed that with an athlete on either end of the spectrum, I would keep them lower, keep them 55 mm. to 65% and not even touch the 70%, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so all that to say, like you're, you're constantly doing all of these things at some volume so that you're auditing them, you're continuing to work on them, you're continuing to spread this stuff out, but the testing and the disparities between each level, each rung as you go up, like that's what's going to give us direction on personalizing. Like we need to do this thing a little bit more often. Um, we need to do this machine a little bit more often, that sort of thing. That's that's the way that you're going to be able to figure out how to pull that off. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do you want to any, – anything else with that before I talk about volume? No, I think we should yeah, proceed. Cool. So volume-wise, a professional CrossFitter, semifinals and CrossFit Games athlete, um, they will be prescribed most of the offseason at least one – of each category. So they do a power output session, they do an anaerobic session, they do an aerobic session, they do a zone two session. And that's every single week. I will still give a monster on machines and or running volume in the off season, especially early in the off season to that effect. The maximum that we're gonna be looking into here is two power, two anaerobic, two aerobic, and three zone two. Um, I think you're specializing a little bit too much if you go beyond that. And I want to clarify those are individual maximums. So like it's not two, 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 three for a certain person. That would be pretty fucking gnarly. But it's like, I need to get better at this. Okay, I'm going to do it twice a week. Um, and again, the, the three days a week on the zone two is the sweet spot that I've found for competition prep for accumulating volume. But it could be like if someone came to me that was a like bigger athlete monster at power output, and just had no pacing ability, um, I would be totally fine with making them do three zone two sessions in a week during the off season, for sure. Um, and the question of, brought it up at the beginning, you asked the question, and I don't even know that I answered the right question, but I said it. Um, I think there's too many machines and modalities to improve on to just to do zero. Maybe I just haven't worked with an athlete that needs to do zero zone two sessions, um, but... I think there's there's too much it's it's a useful tool and it's almost always that an athlete who is an absolute monster on the machines maybe isn't quite as good at first on running something like that so like that's where i would go with that quarterfinals level athlete minimum power output sessions at zero anaerobic one aerobic one zone two one maximum i'd say two across the board like I just don't know that if you haven't gotten to the high end quarterfinals level or in, you know, started to sniff the semifinals level that you need more zone two versus more just like learning how to push yourself in the sport with couplets and triplets and shit like that. Yeah. I think the even spread there is more just like, you know, at the core, even at the quarterfinals level, it's like a lot of those athletes don't have, whether it's, certain skills, certain capacity and, you know, with respect to strength numbers or in a lot of ways it is like athlete IQ stuff, knowing how to pace workouts correctly for their fitness level. Um, I think getting like just getting better across the board at that, like you need to do 
constantly varied functional movement at high yeah. intensity. Yeah. Um, one of the tools that we use for, for weakness work um, is breaking up the gears a little bit um, and essentially achieving the same amount of volume of work and rest. Um, I, you tell me if you agree. I think this is a, an athlete IQ situation, but an a, easy example would be um, an MFT athlete needs to do eight rounds of 90 seconds on, four minutes off on a machine. There are some athletes that at first I give them 16 rounds of 45 seconds on two minutes off because they just can't hold paces and do that. And we try to use linear progression to work them up to the, the actual work to rest that everyone else is doing. Um, but I, I really just find that it's like, I don't know what my pace is supposed to be. I don't like to hurt for that long. Like, you know, there's a lot to the athlete IQ equation, but like, you should be able to do 90 on four off and hold a pace, some pace, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, whatever that is, is just how you, how you that's approach the future piece, right? It's like, exactly. that's the, yes. Yeah. yeah. One trick of the trade is to take, if you're struggling with this and you're just beginning and you're using the gears matrix again, available in that article and there's, there's sample workouts in it is ta only taking your average at the end. That's a decent place to start. You do eight rounds. They're all over the fucking place. Uh, you know, you've got a round in the 130s. You've got a round in the 150s. Like, there's probably going to be a 140s number up there on the average at the top of the, like, summary. That's where I tell people to go. Like, sometimes when you're trying to figure this out, you just, you know, you got to go fuck shit up and then fall apart. <laughs> find, find out that way. Um, I already addressed the whole, like, if you're fit, and you're breaking up all of those different things in that way, that whole like 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off thing. Um, the, the equivalent that we would use for equal work to rest is sixth gear. Uh, it's a real special gear, three and a half on, three and a half off. It's fucking terrible. Um, not very fun. That seems to yield better results than like just tag teaming a machine with your partner. Like, all right, we're going to go minute on, minute off, 30 on, 30 off, 15 on, 15 off. Like, it's going to work. You're going to get a stimulus. Um, but if you're a competitor, I don't know that it really, like, does what you want it to do if you're high level. And you don't need to break it up within that way. Yeah. So beginning of the episode, we talked a little bit about, like, we'll just tell you how to do this and give it away because executing is extremely challenging. Um but one of the more fun examples of seeing this work in action is uh, Paige Semenza's CrossFit Games results in running workouts. Um, 2018, 33rd and 33rd. 2019, 24th and 26th. 2022, 17th and an outlier of 27th. We'll address that here in a second. 2023, 18th and 15th, and then 2024, 11th and 5th. Those are 30, placements in the running workouts the at, yes. each year. And, yeah. yeah, so 33rd to 5th. Um, and the 27th is a bit of an outlier. Uh, physics were not on her side, both in her size and her technique on the pig in the capital. I think she probably, I, I bet she ran a top 20 split on the run, which would be the portion of this that we're referencing. So that is a bit of an outlier there. One huge side tangent is the mental changes that you get over the course of this. 2023 CrossFit Games, 18th and 15th. I believe 15th was the 5K run, um, the fake 5K run, almost 5K run. Uh, I think there was something to the way that she trained all summer, the work that we gave her to improve on the running, breaking into the top 15 for the first time and acknowledging that she can run now because her performance at Rogue, not very long after that, she took 10th in the like, was like mile run, mile run with a ruck. You got to carry this. Like you guys remember that event? She Take took 10th like in that event there. Um, and like, the people who she was racing were 
very high level CrossFit Games athletes. So same kind of idea. She caught a lot of girls on that too. She, she may have been yeah. behind them at first, but she caught up in the long run. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a tipping point for her. And her and I have talked about it a little bit. And just this idea of like running is really is so mentally driven. Like you're alone, you're breathing your ass off. There's no machine sound to be drowned out. There's no music from the gym. Like you just, you don't, it, it's tough to pace. It's tough to know what you're doing. It's being a good runner within the sport is incredibly challenging physically and mentally. Um, so to go into the 2024 games with the idea, I am a runner is how she took fifth in an all running event, right? So we've taken, we've gone from 33rd to fifth and, you know, she didn't have a wide base or the highest peak. She kind of just had a small triangle <laughs> that needed to be grown in each direction. And it's like specific zone two volume, specific first, second and third gear, specific fourth through eighth, and then like our power output is typically a little bit longer when it comes to running, you know, your 300s, 400s, that kind of thing so that we don't snap hamstrings when we don't need to. Um, and she just did the work, especially from like 21 to 24. She ran a shitload of 90 minute zone two running sessions. She always did, you know, a handful of the gears one, two, and three, a handful of four through eight. She just put in the time and did that and took herself from 33rd to 5th. Like, I'd be willing to just put the workouts out there and tell people, like, here they are, good luck. Um, but it's a you know such a huge representation, and I also put a note in there that she came in ninth on Chad. Like, that's – she. I don't know if you've stood next to Paige. Uh, didn't have the longest legs in the world. <laughs> um, but she – knows what it feels like to work out for a really long period of time. And like, again, she's got a hold like those two rounds of 15 minutes on 30 or 60 seconds off, like at max speed, you learn something about yourself and, and what it feels like to push too hard or not go hard enough, that sort of thing. So, um, it works. All of this works. It takes a while for it to, to take shape. You have to, to do the testing and the retesting and figure out where you're lacking. Um, but even someone who's lacking a lot, like the, the, it still looks pretty balanced. Like we're like adding one zone two session here and saying like you only need you to do one or zero power output session. Yeah, it's a slight first. increase in one exactly. for, and a reduction in the other, but it's not a, not a massive swing in one direction or the other. No, it isn't. Um, and again, this is our answer to like, I need to improve on my energy systems and or a machine um, and how we attack it and how we've monitored how it works over the years. And again, the, the specific workouts that we write are intended to force you to go faster or slower than another session to get that full spectrum of all the way from like P1, 600 watts down to like zone two, 200 watts, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, for, and for Paige too, like I think part of the reason it would be fine to put every single workout that she did over those seven years available is because like she's in the 99th percentile of mental fortitude and toughness. Uh, and so like you can, yeah. you can look at those workouts on paper and you can, execute them but i'm willing to bet that you're not going to execute them in the way that that page did <laughs> but that go i mean like, that goes to like but the results are like the results speak for themselves and it is possible uh it's just a matter of having the right approach both in the program and uh, you know the how you approach it mentally yeah she so she went to the games in 2017 on a team and qualified 18 19 indy and then did not qualify 20 and 21 indy and there was some writing on the wall of what was coming up in her career. We had a training camp during that period of time. And one of the questions that comes up a lot from campers in our Q&A that we do is like, what do you do when you just feel like absolute dog shit? You don't want to fucking train and you like don't go in and whatever. 
And a lot of the answers over the years were like, give yourself a little bit of fucking space. Like if you just beat yourself into the ground every second of every day, then like you're not going to improve. You're not going to recover. And she was taking camp and raised her hand and said, I just do it anyways. And it was like silent for like a while (laughs) because there was like like all these games athletes at the front who were like, womp, womp, that had given another answer. And she went on to say like, I don't put like monumental expectations on myself, but I want to know that I can perform when I don't want to. So like it might, the, the box checking might just be, I did this. I didn't want to fucking do it and I did it. She's like, but a lot of times you're halfway through and you're like, yeah, endorphins, I feel way better. Like, let's get after it, that sort of thing. Yeah. So there was definitely something to that and that is foreshadowing to, okay, the best finish I ever had at the games in a running event was 24th place in 2019. I obviously need to make some changes here. Like, okay, we come back out 17th and then we track all the way up to fifth place. It's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. Very. And guess what she did? She did zone two. She did gears one through eight. She did power output workouts. She did that shit on fucking repeat. (laughs) And that's how we do it. And And while working around a lot of injuries as well. Yeah. Very true. Very true. All right. Um, we did, 45 minutes to an hour of babbling about energy systems. Um, I'm wondering what the like nerd level will need to be for someone not to fall asleep during this episode. This information is incredibly important. Um, I have no idea whether the delivery was entertaining or not. Um, <laughs> parts of it definitely weren't cause I was bored and I was saying it. Um, but it's like, can be a huge unlock to be like, I'm not going to go hunt for the like, perfect breakdown of x y and z i need to work on all of these energy systems in unison with one another and if there's like a huge outlier i'll work on that a little bit more but like it's this works better than i didn't do well let's say we we didn't used to use the cube test but let's say we i didn't do well in the cube test and i'm just gonna stay right there two three times a week i'm gonna fucking bash myself and do it this way you're not going to see the development that we see when we force people to go faster and slower for shorter and longer periods of time. Yeah. I think my, my final thoughts on the topic is that all of this is it, it, not that it only matters, but it kind of only matters if you're able to identify what's happening from like a, you know, a development standpoint are my paces getting faster, but then apply them to the sport. So then apply them to your Metcon, then apply them to your, your interval, your interval work of thrusters, rowing and box jumps. Right. So like, cause there are very few purely monostructural tests that we see and even fewer at the levels of like the online competition status. It's not until semifinals that we might see like a very just straight up purely monostructural type thing. We've seen some longer stuff for the age of age like AGOQ athletes, row, burpee, that sort of thing. But for the most part, like we have to be able to translate the effort and output that gets put forth on simple monostructural machine work where there is very little skill involved and you do have that monitor to stare to stare you right in the face and tell you objectively how fast, how slow you're going, what the numbers look like and whatnot. But that doesn't matter that much unless you can translate what the the feel of that effort level you know is on a machine and then translate it into a metcon it doesn't matter unless you can identify the fact that like you know 10 minutes into a 20 minute amrap you've accidentally gone too fast and you need to throttle back to the equivalent of you know a zone 2 pace or a third gear pace for a few minutes to like get yourself back in a place where you can sustain the output for the remaining 7 minutes of the amrap Um, we just see it so often that, you know, the athlete actually, an athlete actually has well-developed energy systems or at least developed enough for the test that they're about to undergo. And then they're an idiot with how they approach it. And it's like, congratulations. You just like, you just drove down the highway in with your car in second gear, like sounded sick for like eight seconds, but now you're just burning fuel and you look like an asshole. So, um, 
the the yeah that we we have to be able to translate this to the five minute AMRAP, the ten minute AMRAP, the five rounder, the three rounder, the weird open interval test that happens, or just the straight up, you know, rowing and burpee we saw in an AGOQ a couple of years ago. It's like what four K row, eighty burpees, something stupid like that, or in in the opposite direction, and it's just like. It's not testing burpee and rowing capacity. It's testing your aerobic capacity. Um, so being able to to kind of identify what the test is calling for and then translate the machine work that you've done and, you know, what you know about your energy systems into the conditioning piece. That's the sport. Final thoughts. Should you do it? Yes. How often? How long? We just fucking told you. Um and we'll address this again 212 more times in the future just to just to make sure that you guys know what you should be doing do we do it did it did it thank you for tuning into another episode of the misfit podcast make sure you head to misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs team misfit.com or the sugar wad marketplace for your affiliate programming needs we'll see you next week